Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon to some of you, and welcome to our webinar, Automatically Verifying the Quality for Professional Requirements According to the BABOC Guide. Please remain muted during the webinar, and if you have any questions or comments, you can use the chat box. But please address your comments to uh, the reuse company and not directly to the presenter. If you have any technical issues, you can also use the chat box or send an email to support at reusecompany.com. The webinar will be recorded and in a few days we will send you the link to the recording. So, who are we? Uh, my name is uh, Cecilia Carlson from the Marketing and Communications Department and I will be the host today. With me, I have Jose Pereira from the commercial department, and he will do the presentation in just a moment. We work at the, the Reuse Company, and uh, this company was created in 1999 as a spin off from a university in Madrid, in Spain, by system and software engineers. Our headquarters is in Madrid, but we also have an office in Stockholm, in Sweden, and a delegation in Tokyo. We are also planning to open an office in the US shortly. Our mission is to promote a reusable, scalable and global solution to a smart and interoperable systems engineering environment. And we do this by offering a semantic knowledge centric approach. The reuse company is also called TRC. We like to say that it's easy to remember if you think of T like in traceability, R like in reuse, and C, like in calidad, which means quality in English. This is the agenda for the webinar. First, we'll take a look at what BAVOC is. Then we will talk about requirements verification. Next, we will see the main characteristics. And after that, Jose will show us a hands-on uh, use case and associated tasks. Finally, we will have some time for questions. So, good morning, Jose. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're doing great. And as uh, Cecilia has explained, uh, we'll be taking a look at, uh, at the approach that uh, we have here at the Reuse Company uh, to the BABOC um, guide itself. And uh, yeah, let's uh, jump right into it. Okay, so we'll start things off by uh, defining and explaining what is actually uh, BABOC. Uh, most of you will probably already know this, but uh, just to go through the basics, we will take a look at the purpose, and then we will uh, try to look at the different knowledge areas that comprise this uh, body of knowledge. So let's start by the uh, name itself, BABOC, which is actually uh, translated as, uh, or it means the business analysis body of knowledge and business analysis, it's basically, uh, let's say, a domain dedicated to enable change within companies. And they do so by um, both uh, defining the uh, profession itself and a set of common practices to uh, accomplish this, uh, this change. Uh, it is also required to um, dedicate uh, resources uh, in order to um, define or uh, specify the different needs that the company has in terms of change and also recommend solutions in sequence to uh, these um, new directions that uh, we want to give the company. Okay. So uh, within this body of knowledge, what we have uh, is the six different knowledge areas. The first one is going to be business analysis, planning and monitoring. We move on to solicitation and collaboration. Then requirements life cycle management. We proceed with the strategy analysis, and then we move on to requirements analysis and design definition. This section will be the most important one and the one on which we will focus the rest of the presentation. And finally, uh, solution evaluation. So, as I just mentioned, we're going to take a look at requirements analysis and uh, design definition specifically the part regarding requirements verification. And in this section, what we will be taking a look at is, first of all, what is our requirements verification? How uh, can we actually perform it? 
and which is our own experience here at the reuse company. So for the what question, we're talking about a task within these knowledge, um, knowledge domains or knowledge areas, but we have our different tasks. In this case, the first one is going to be, uh, or the one that we are uh, be focusing on is going to be a requirements verification. And as you can see on screen, what we have is a task, which is divided into inputs and guideline tools and tool, sorry. So these both combined uh, will lead in this case to outputs. And as you can see on the right hand side of, uh, of the, of the uh, screen, um, for the inputs, what we have is basically requirements themselves, just uh, elicited or uh, written. And then what we have is combined with guidelines and tools, in this case, requirements lifecycle management tools, we're going to verify those requirements and the output is going to be, of course, the approved, hopefully the approved requirements themselves. Okay. So moving on to how can we actually do this? Because this is a very generic um, idea or very generic concept. We have to basically meet a set of quality standards. So we need to verify those requirements against a set of rules that uh, imply a good quality, right? And this basically means, or it translates into a well written and easily understood requirements, but it is not easy to do with those two commands. So let's, let's take a deeper look uh, later into this. Okay. So regarding our experience uh, in terms of requirements verification, we have worked previously with, uh, by creating uh, different libraries uh, in terms of quality using uh, well, standards such as EARS, INCOSI, NASA, and SOFTS. Okay, and among those, now we can include also Babak. Very good. So within these uh, knowledge areas, we have mentioned that we have different tasks. Specifically, in this case, we're going to take a look at requirements verification. And within requirements verification, we have talked about the different uh, ideas that uh, comprise this uh, process, right? And we're going to now sure. take a look at the main characteristics, which are themselves more specific and will provide us with more insight regarding on how to uh, write uh, requirements more clearly and to be um, less um, less confusing, let's say, when when executing this process. Okay. So first of all, we're going to talk about the definitions. What is a characteristic? Because we need to di differentiate between two concepts. First of all, is going to be the characteristic itself. And then we're going to talk about the metric, right? So the characteristic, we're talking about a feature specific feature for writing professional requirements. These are mentioned strictly or specifically by the uh, body of knowledge uh, uh, guide, right? What we are talking about is characteristics such as ethnicity, completeness, and ambiguity, so on and so forth, right? And then these features we here at PRC are converting them or extracting from them different perspectives and building based upon these perspectives a set of key rules to be able to assess the quality of those requirements right this is a relationship usually uh one to n right because for each characteristic coming from the babok guide we create several uh, several metrics sorry within our uh, own uh, environment right because we want to evaluate and we want to verify the different perspectives or the different insights that we have uh, regarding each specific characteristic. Okay. So let's go right into the four characteristics. We have nine of them regarding, once again, our requirements verification. We're going to start off by the first one, which is going to be atomicity. Okay. So for a requirement to be atomic, basically we're talking, uh, we're talking about a requirement which is self-sufficient, a requirement which does not need any other requirement within the specification to be understood, okay? In order to evaluate this, let's take a brief look uh, through the different metrics that we have here. If you have any doubts regarding any of those, please feel free to interrupt me or uh, leave a, a question on the chat box. So let's begin by checking, for example, the number of condition clauses. We have too many condition clauses. This requirement is, of course, not atomic, as we are including several additional structures that we do not require, right? And we're making things more confusing, more complicated, and maybe we require an additional requirement to explain the additional conditions that we have included, okay? 
For the second one, checking the text length by counting the number of paragraphs. If we have a requirement specified with several paragraphs within it, this could be also a problem because in, instead of having two different paragraphs in the same requirement, we should at least uh, separate them into two different requirements, let's say. For the third one, controlling the number of action verbs out of the condition block. We only want a condition, then the subject, the system shall uh, perform whatever activity. We do not want to have several activities involved in the same requirement, as once again, these should be uh, separated into several specifications. Okay. For the fourth one, checking the number of model verbs. This comes right ahead and, and talks about uh, uh, some similarities with the previous one. Multiple subject and multiple verbs detection. These are both, uh, once again, very similar, but uh, of course they refer to each specific uh, uh, part of the domain, in this case, subjects and verbs consequently. And basically what they are uh, implying is that we, they are checking or they are assessing that within a requirement, we do not have, uh, let's say two, um, the system and subsystem shall perform X activity, right? It should be also, once again, separated into uh, requirements. Okay. For the second one, we're talking about completeness, right? And this basically means that the requirement contains sufficient information that in, in order to be understood without needing any additional notes or any additional resources, right? In this case, it's basically, uh, it translates basically in having this set of uh, metrics, for example, we have uh, some, some more, but as you, uh, as you can see uh, on, on the bottom, this will be tackled uh, in a subsequent section. But the first one we're talking about enforcing the use of a complete sentence structure. This basically means um, that we need a specific structure according to the type of requirement that, that we're dealing with. And of course, in order to, for it to be complete, it cannot lack uh, uh, parts, let's say, within this, uh, this general structure. For the second one, enable numbers uh, to be followed by uh, units or noun predicators. This is very important because if we have a value, a numeric value, and we lack the measurement unit, then we're lacking part of the information that we require, right? Avoiding the use of open-ended clauses. In this case, this is basically the same. We want the information to be close and to be compacted into the requirement specification. For the fourth one, forcing to include the tolerance value. This is once again related with the measurement units uh, metric. And of course, if we also lack information once we don't, we lack or once we do not have uh, the measurement unit, we also lack information when we do not have a specific tolerance, right? For the fifth one, avoiding unspecified subjects. I think this is pretty self-explanatory because we are lacking a subject and therefore uh, there's room for confusion, there's room for lacking uh, information itself regarding uh, the system, subsystem or element that we are referring to. Very good. Okay, excellent. For the third one, we're talking about consistency, and this basically translates into um, not being overlapped, not having duplicated uh, requirements, um, and of course, having homogeneous um, unit uh, measurement units. Uh, so for the first metric that we have designed, uh, bear in mind that uh, these metrics that we have designed correlate to each characteristic we will see uh, later in the uh, session uh, within uh, specifically the practical um, use case, we'll see how we can um, move or translate between uh, these theoretical concepts into an actual practice. Okay. So for the first metric, we're talking about detecting inappropriate subjects at some document level. So we are talking about the overall system. We do not want to have uh, requirements with the subject itself um, being, for example, uh, a subsystem or a component within a subsystem, right? For the second one, detecting inadequate units for a characteristic. We do not want to have, to have a property weight mentioned and then the measurement units to be kilometers or something similar, right? For the third one, exceeded measurements, we also do not want to have, uh, uh, let's say, inconsistent uh, measurement um, values, right? Uh, this also, of course, impacts uh, later the uh, feasibility uh, we will talk about uh, subsequently, uh, but this is uh, basically a preemptive um, met metric designed to, in this case, evaluate the part of the consistency. 
Okay. For the first one, we're talking about conciseness, and conciseness basically means that um, we are addressing a single or unique characteristic, concept, so on and so forth, specifically or uniquely in each requirement. Right. So for the, for the for the first one, we're trying to avoid having very complicated structures and being simplistic when trying to uh, communicate information. And for the first one, superfluous infinitives B A O two is something that we are going to try to avoid. For the second one, checking the text length by counting the words themselves is also very important because uh, they, they are a requirement that despite having good extra structure, they are very long or they have too complicated structure um, in order to uh, communicate something that could be uh, separated or fragmented into different specifications. For the third one, avoid phrases that indicate the purpose. We try not to um, specify neither the purpose nor the solution, as you will see in the next metric. And for the fifth one, uh, sorry, for the sixth one, no, fifth one, sorry, avoid the use of flow sentences, which basically means um, unless, as well as, so on and so forth, right? We're trying to include more information into a requirement which should be uh, completed and compacted as it is, right? For the fifth one, we're talking about feasibility, right? Feasibility basically means that we are able to realize whatever we're specifying within the requirements with an acceptable risk. And this last part is important because, of course, there are plenty of things that can be done, but with a huge amount of resources and they are not viable, right, within our project. So for the first metric that we have is avoiding unachievable absolute expressions impossible to verify. This is exactly what I was talking about. Uh, the risk is also to be taken into consideration when trying to specify requirements. Okay. Visibility checklist. This is basically a checklist that we have created with a set of questions that allows you to evaluate whether or not uh, their requirements is visible. And um, yeah, for the visibility, that's it. Going on to the sixth one. And ambiguous basically it means that we need to write clear uh, requirements and this translates basically into uh, a grammatical stand uh, point of view and um, in order to do so we try to enforce uh, let's say this grammatical structure as much as possible we do so first of all by avoiding the use of band model verbs and band model verbs are a set of uh, verbs that we can define within our knowledge base or our ontology and uh, this, uh, some examples for this could be should, might, may, but it depends on the context and uh, the company that we are talking about, right? For the second one, I would the use of indefinite articles in front of uh, an agent. I want to specify directly the subject, the agent, the element uh, that we're talking about. The third one, avoiding the use of escape clauses, which basically means um, if necessary, um, in situation, in specific situation, let's say, uh, and we try to avoid those in order to be specific and to be consistent throughout the entire specification with uh, the preciseness or the, the, the accuracy that we defined our information. For the fourth one, avoid the use of temporal indefinite keywords out of the condition block. Within the condition block, we, es we can estimate it to be okay, but outside of it, we try to avoid it as much as possible. For the sixth one, or for the fifth one, sorry, avoid the use of negative expressions out of the condition block. This uh, depends, uh, this and the last one, which is avoiding the use of not and other negative expressions, just in a general way, can uh, be tailored according to the situation and according to the type of requirement that we are uh, specifying. Because I've seen many cases in which um, safety requirements are written in a negative way, right? Because it is easier to explain or to mention, to describe. Um, what it should not occur, what must not occur, then what all the different cases that uh, that should or that shall occur. Okay, so it's something that the that can be easily tailored. For the seventh one, we're talking about testable, and testable basically means, or in a practical way, means that uh, it needs uh, to be able to verify. We need to be able to verify this requirement, and if it is not verifiable, then it is not, of course, tested. For the first metric, we're talking about avoiding the use of imprecise quantifiers, right? Applied to specifically a property in this case. Uh, and this imprecise quantifiers, of course, make really complicated the measurement itself uh, for the verification process. 
ensuring the tolerance for the second one, the tolerance values are with beam and now they create the value range. This is another uh, metric that we have to find in the same direction as the previous one. Uh, this is also to contribute to the verification process and to make it possible. And uh, finally, the third one is going to be avoid the use of imprecise uh, quantifiers. This, uh, as you can see, is general. It is not specifically applied to properties. And uh, once again, as with the previous case, um, it can be easily tailored and adapted to uh, the project situation. Okay. So for the eighth one, we're talking about prioritize, and this basically means that uh, it is ranked, it is grouped um, by terms of importance. Okay. And in this one, we have one metric, and it's enforced that the attribute type is not empty, so that we have different priorities, and we can define a an attribute specific to um, defining or to provide information regarding the priority that it has. Okay. So for the ninth one and the last one, it's going to be understandable. Basically, means that um, it needs to be understood, of course, by by all the uh, people. But uh, this translates basically more into the using common uh, terminology, having an ontology, a, a common knowledge base uh, with a set of terms predefined uh, for the project. In this case, the first metric that we have created uh, to contribute to this is going to be avoiding incorrect spelling. Right? We can detect whether or not there is a, a grammatical error. Uh, for the second one, avoid out of domain dictionary nouns. This, uh, once again, if we have, uh, if we appear to detect one term that has not been included into the ontology or into the knowledge base, then we would recognize it and warn uh, the user about it. So that he or she can decide whether or not to uh, include it into the ontology or just discard it. For the third one, determine, uh, determine sorry, if this subject is a recognized agent term, we uh, have specific set of um, terms that we define as agents. And these agents are the main subjects of the uh, requirements. Um, and of course, if we detect that there is a subject which is not within this group, then we can warn the user and he or she can decide upon it. For the fourth one, facilitate readability. This is uh, very simple uh, because it basically uh, analyzes the structure and, and the terms uh, within the uh, actual requirement to, uh, in this case, well, uh, facilitate, uh, which is the comprehension of the information that we have within the requirement. For the fifth one, we're talking about enforcing the use of uh, defined terms by avoiding synonyms. We have a set of, um, of terms within our ontology and our knowledge base, and we do not want to derive from it uh, by using different uh, terms, even if they're synonyms themselves. So for the last one, avoiding the use of unknown abbreviations. These need to be specified also within our knowledge base and on our ontology in order well, to not um, um, lead to confusion when uh, receiving information from an upper layer or a different one. Very good, so we have finished the uh, more theoretical part, which comprehends the main characteristics. Now we move on to the hands-on use case, right? So in this part, let me just uh, switch screen. Okay, very good. I don't know if uh, you can see my my screen right now, the demo. Okay, now you should. Uh, if you if you guys could uh, provide me with uh, a little bit of the uh, feedback, is the screen being shared uh, correctly? Yes, we can yeah, see yeah, we can your see. screen. Okay, thank you very much. Very good. So what we are doing basically now, I'm showing you um, one of our tools, and in this tool, uh, what we will be doing is basically execute a use case in which we have a set of specific requirements, as you can see here. We have a complete set of requirements that, that uh, we have extracted from, in this case, a connection to three doors module. Um, and I want to go to my uh, quality view, because what we uh, basically want to do is to um, Based upon this implemented or theoretically theoretically revised uh, 
uh, quality metrics. We want to apply them to our specification and to see which are the results. Okay. So if we move on to the uh, quality view in this case, what we will be doing basically is to analyze the results that we have obtained and see how these uh, theoretically explained uh, metrics can impact the results of uh, or the structure of the different uh, requirements specification. Okay. So this is the actual view. As you can see, I have already conducted the uh, evaluation of, uh, of the quality. But first of all, what I would like to do before getting into any details, we're going to talk about a, um, a set, a baseline, a quality baseline, which is the um, set or the container with all these quality metrics that we have talked about before, right? So this is my um, baseline, which is the box set of quality metrics. And within it, I have all these quality metrics that we have uh, revised previously, okay? One very important, important and interesting thing to take into consideration is, for example, that, um, that what we have here is the translation between the theory and the practice, right? And how are we actually able to, um, based upon this uh, idea of, for example, checking the number of condition clauses, provide you with a result which is visually appealing, right? Or which is in this case, a set of uh, stars, a number of specific stars indicating whether or not the, the quality is low, medium, or high, right? And this basically is represented by having one star as low, two stars as medium quality, and three stars as high quality, okay? So in this case, what we have here is, for example, let's take the first one, check the number of condition clauses, right? What we basically do is using natural language processing, we analyze the requirement itself, and if we detect within your requirement two or more, let's say, right? If we are within the range or outside the range, we will provide you with a different value. So in this case, if we are between zero and one, we obtain either zero condition clauses or one condition clause, we will provide you with a quality star of a uh, quality level of three stars, right? So it's high quality. If we detect using our natural language processing algorithms that you have two or more uh, condition clauses, then we will provide you with one star, right? This is how we move on to, we move, sorry, from the uh, qualitative to the quantitative side and vice versa. And then we return you a specific value concerning the uh, quality of the requirement itself, okay? If you guys have any question regarding this, uh, this is very important, but it is also a bit tricky to, to explain sometimes and to understand. So if you have any question, please uh, feel free to interrupt me or uh, leave a, a question in the chat box, okay? So this is basically the entire set of quality metrics that we have talked about. As you can see, we have divided them into the different uh, um, characteristics that we described before. So if we want to uh, see specifically which are concerning, which ones are concerning ethnicity, then we have them here. But basically what we do is this um, baseline, this set of uh, quality metrics, is going to be applied to our own specification. And we do so by going for project configuration and assigning here the uh, quality metric that we have uh, uh, created, right? In this case, our Babot set of quality metrics. Okay. So once we have finished that, once we have assigned our set of quality metrics to evaluate the, the quality of your overall specification, we would go here and simply assess the correctness, for example, of uh, the entire specification, okay? And we would obtain this results right here, right? But what I want to do is basically um, is search for a specific case that I have here and that I, I encounter when analyzing this, uh, this uh, requirement specification. And it is very interesting because what we have here, it's a requirement stating the following. So the temperature warrior, as you can see here, this is our offering window. Let's uh, take a look at the requirement. Temperature warrior should be designed to be flexible and light. And as, as you have already seen throughout our theoretical part of the presentation, uh, this is a very, very poor requirement, right? 
Um, and how can we actually know this? Uh, if, we, if we know nothing about what we have talked about previously, uh, the tool provides you here with an in real time quality assessment. Okay, so it's going to provide us in real time as we write or as we remove elements from the requirement, it's going to provide us with the result itself. But not only that, it's also going to provide us with which specific metric is, um, is warning us and where is the actual issue located. Okay, so in this case, we're talking about a conciseness issue and it's basically uh, superfluous infinitives. So is, if instead of using um, B design two, right? Let's say should um, should be flexible and light. And as you can see, automatically the conciseness issues uh, have disappeared. Okay, but we also have an ambiguous problems. Okay, so for example, avoid the use of combinators out of the condition flow. The tool detects that we have no condition flows at all, right? within this requirement, and it's also detecting that here we have an end, a combinator, right? So we would have to separate this into another one, and the light part would, would go onto another requirement. But if we remove this part for now, we see that the first unambiguous issue has disappeared, okay? We do not have any more the problem with combinators. Now, avoid the use of band model groups. In this case, we can go down here and see that within our set of uh, model band verbs, we have should, right? Should belongs to this group of model verbs that we do not want to have within our specifications. Some um, model verbs that we desire or we want to have within our specification are shall, must, for example. So let's go for the first one, shall be flexible. And in this case, once again, it has disappeared. We do not have any, any, any more the problem of having a band model verb. Finally, avoid the use of fake terms because flexible is not a specific term or it's not a, a concise term, let's say, right? But being vague with our specification and provide a precise information, okay? So um, if we would put shall be flexible instead, uh, shall be, um, let's say, shall temperature warrior, the weight, for example, of the temperature warrior shall be uh, 50 kilograms, for example, right? If we want it to be uh, flexible or if we want it to be, uh, let's try to find a similar way of implying this. Uh, first of all, being verifiable, right? Because being flexible is not verifiable. And of course, not being vague um, as we do not have any accurate information with those kind of terms. As you can see, this requirement is, is perfectly fine. And as you can notice on the right-hand side, we have high quality uh, with no issues at all, which is the objective of, uh, of having this specification. Of course, in this case, what we have here is, um, is our own approach, let's say, let's, uh, let's get close. Um, it's our own approach. Uh, as you can see, the quality has changed automatically. We have now three stars. And this is something that you can tailor at your own will. Uh, not only um, within the quality baseline, so for example, here, uh, as you can uh, notice, in this column, we have uh, enables, right? And this means that any um, policy metric that we do not want, let's say, for example, that we not, do not want to, to evaluate um, this one, checking the length uh, of the requirement by counting the words. So we just right click and enable the selector. And as you can see, this will no longer be uh, considered when evaluating the quality, right? You can also tailor the, the parameters here. This can be modified at your will. So we change it to 40, let's say, from 4 to 40, because we estimate, okay, it is overlapped. So I, I would need to change the upper level into, let's say, for example, um, 70, say. And this would go to 70 also. And so on and so forth, right? So you can tailor, you can customize at your um, need, right? The different quality metrics and also the quality baseline overall, right? So this would conclude the uh, practical part of the session. If you guys have uh, any question, I, I might have seen a question here in the chat. If it's um, okay, 
Very good. So if not, we will continue with the documentation. This is the real time uh, quality evaluation that we have seen. And now we are, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the associated tasks that uh, that we currently cover and the ones that we are um, approaching to, to cover in the near future. So for the ones that uh, we already do cover, there's uh, communicate business analysis, right? Traceability, change management, requirements quality management, as you have seen, requirements approval. We can also verify uh, those requirements. Instead of, uh, of having only um, a verification, a classic verification from uh, system against the requirements, we also have uh, or provide the capability to, based upon the results that you have seen, the number of quality stars or the quality level that, that we have, we can verify or validate um, these requirements themselves. Okay. And for the future coverage, we're talking about models quality, decision management, information management, risk assessment, and finally, acquisition management. Okay. So all these functionalities are also coming in the uh, near future uh, versions, and we will provide them, uh, of course, with coverage to uh, the Babakai in this case. Very good. So thank you very much for uh, over your time and, and your attention. And now, if you have any uh, further questions, then I'll be uh, glad to, to answer. Thank you, Jose, for your presentation. Uh, we will continue with the question section in a minute. So if you want to ask Jose anything, please write down your questions in the chat box and remember to address them to the reuse company or to everyone and not directly to Jose. Uh, meanwhile, Jose will give us some information about our next webinar. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, for the next session, I'm really excited for this uh, because um, I'm more focused on the verification and validation uh, side. And uh, in this presentation, we're going to um, try to challenge ourselves and explain to you uh, in 15 minutes um, a couple of use cases regarding verification and validation using these uh, capabilities that I talked about previously. One of those use cases, of course, involves um, the verification based upon the quality of results, right? It could be a verification of the requirements against a set of uh, quality standards. And uh, I think it's going to be really valuable for anyone who's interested in verification and validation. Definitely. So the dates would be March the 29th and March the 31st of, uh, of course, uh, 2022. And uh, we hope uh, to see you there. Yes, thank you. Uh, questions. Mm, how do you process requirements expressed within tables with a structure sometimes complex in terms of columns or lines? Um, this is a really interesting question. Um, we can connect to many different sources, and I believe that uh, you're talking about specifically, uh, for example, having a table within Word. Um, uh, if, um, if there's uh, any possibility for classification, then uh, that would be also appreciated. But if you actually mean uh, this, um, then we definitely have uh, the tools and we're able to, um, based upon this natural language processing algorithm, to extract information, even if it is uh, within this kind of structure. Okay, thank you. And uh, then we have a comment. It would be interesting to see more on definition of metrics in the system and more examples on how they work in practice. Definitely. Uh, we have uh, plenty of different resources uh, within um, our website. And uh, if you guys uh, would like to contact me, uh, Cecilia, please uh, could you uh, write my email down on the chat box so that uh, anyone that uh, wants more information, more resources uh, can directly address me. and. Um, and uh, also the, uh, the link to the web page uh, and to the section of the webinars, because um, as this uh, presentation has been concluded, um, we have plenty of different uh, webinars, of course, um, uh, tackling, let's say, or um, uh, dealing with, uh, with the quality part of, uh, of uh, systems engineering. So I, I more than definitely recommend you to, to go and check those, those out. Yeah, that's fine. Um, then we have a question about the library. Is it possible mm -hmm. to modify and customize the content of the library? Yes, uh, of course, of course. 
Uh, this, this content can be modified at uh, your will, as I was mentioning. Um, you can uh, customize not only each uh, specific uh, quality metric, but also the quality baseline itself. So once you have tailored a specific uh, quality metric, you can select uh, whether or not to disable or uh, enable it according to the part of the project that uh, you're dealing with, right? And if there's a new version coming up and I already did a change, uh, or I already did change the content, would that overwrite my changes or could the new content be merged with the current one? Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. Um, so we tend to improve uh, and, and continue improving um, our versions, uh, in this case regarding the, the library. So of course you will receive uh, a new version. Um, and if this happens, um, you will not lose your assessment result. Right, which is very important. Uh, you can simply uh, plug once again your library on top of the one that you had. Uh, the previous one will be outdated, so it will be removed. And uh, basically, the results will uh, remain there as long as uh, you want. Right? If you want to uh, reevaluate the entire specification as you did before, then you will you will lose um, those changes. But if if you have um, previously evaluated the comments. You can just simply select the remaining ones and evaluate those so that you can do not lose any of the previous work, right? Okay, thank you, Jose. Thank you. So let's uh, finish here. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. If you have any additional questions later or want more information about our tools, don't hesitate to contact us uh, directly to Jose or, or um, to our email contact at reusecompany.com or through our website reusecompany.com. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you very much.